All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, PQTCP and uh, how this can help in the tinification of the Linux kernel. And for that, I'll first give you some more context. Uh, because we're all here to talk about the Internet of Things and about using small embedded devices to, co to communicate with each other, to communicate with, with the cloud and things like that. And we've got this great operating system, which is Linux, and we'd like to use it as much as possible in the IoT. So this is briefly the, uh, the contents that I'm gonna, gonna go through. And the first point is uh, the problem. Wh what is the problem that we see for using uh, the Linux kernel in the IO IoT? What can you do about it? Uh, what, what did we do about it and how did we do it? So there's this uh, famous quote that says that Linux runs on everything from cell phones to supercomputers. And while that's absolutely true, a uh, cell phone nowadays, I took here the example of a Nexus 5, is a cell phone with uh, 2.3 gigahertz uh, CPU. It's a quad core and it has two gigabytes of RAM. This is not what what I think of when I'm thinking of, a, of an embedded device and certainly not the device that we want to use in the IoT and small sensor nodes uh, and things like that. So indeed Linux runs on these systems but this is a, a figure I stole from another uh, presentation talking about the tinification of the, of the Linux kernel. And uh, at the bottom, I'm not sure you can see it, but uh, here in the corner there's a kernel version 3.0 going to 3.17 at the right hand side of the, of the graph. And uh, here we can see the minimum kernel size. Well, actually, it's not really the minimum kernel size. This is, this is what make all no config. So it's a default kernel configuration. And what we see is that it's steadily growing. So your kernel is getting bigger and bigger with every version you get. There's a small bump there when, when the option was introduced to compile out the, the TTY. But uh, other, other than that, it's always increasing. And this is not a good thing for, for tiny, tiny embedded systems. So what, what is a tiny embedded system? What, what kind of system am, am I thinking about here? Uh, for the example, I, I took a development board from, from MCraft. And this, is, uh, this has a Cortex-M4 microcontroller on it, uh, one from ST, ST32F4. This is a microcontroller that's being used uh, a lot on tiny embedded systems um, because, uh, well, it's, it's cheap, it's small, and has a lot of peripherals on board. It runs at 180 megahertz. And uh, additionally to, the, to this microcontroller, on this board they added some uh, SD RAM, 32 megabytes, which is ample, you could do with a lot less, and 16 megabytes of flash, but this is just to get comfortable with Linux, uh, and also as a development platform it's, it's nice to have a little, little overhead, but you can actually go a lot smaller uh, on, on this system. And the Cortex-M4 is a microcontroller that you would usually uh, run bare metal of or with a small real-time operating system on it. Here we're going to run a uh, Linux kernel on it. And what, what can you do to run Linux comfortably on this kind of board? First of all, you'll have to use UC Linux because this uh, CPU, which I just mentioned, has no memory management unit. So that's the first step you'll, you'll have to take. Uh, UC Linux has other interesting uh, additional features to, to run in, a, in a, an efficient way on, on small embedded systems. But it's also uh, only kernel 2.6, uh, uh, at least the version we used right now, so it's, it's lacking a bit behind, but okay. Uh, you can do things like execute in place, so uh, usually your kernel gets loaded and decompressed in, in your memory and RAM. Uh, you don't want to do that here because you can uh, uh, read the read-only data and the code straight from flash to spare some RAM. That's one of the things you can do. Uh, Read-write will, of course, still be in, in RAM. Uh, but the trade-off here is that you cannot use kernel compression anymore because you have to execute code in place. Uh, another option that was added lately, uh, I think somewhere 3.17 in the kernel, is make tiny config. Because there is, there is this movement of uh, making this, the Linux kernel smaller. Uh, and this actually introduces some options like using the minus OS switch from GCC to, to actually get, get that kernel size down. It's not in favor of performance, of course, but when you need the space, you need the space. But then we thought about something else. What if we could replace the TCP IP stack? I mean, Linux kernel runs on so, so many server computers all around the world, but we're, we're trying to, to reach the other end of microcontrollers here, not not a big, uh, not a big servers with with uh, tens of CPUs and gigabytes of memory. We really want to go to the small side, and the T 
TCP IP stack in the Linux kernel is not focused or built uh, for these kind of devices. So that's where uh, we come in. We, we've got this project that's called Pico TCP. It's a, it's a free software project uh, that's backed by, by the company I work for. And uh, we want to we wanna promote the stack as the reference uh, TCP IP stack for the Internet of Things. Uh, it's a stack that's, that's fully featured. Uh, there's really a, a lot of features in there, but it's also very modular, so you can really select every single thing that you want or don't want in. And it's highly portable. It runs on, on anything from an 8-bit AVR up to uh, yeah, a 64-bit uh, server computer. You can run it uh, inside, in, uh, inside an operating system or just bare metal. And now you can also run it inside the Linux kernel instead of the TCP IP stack that's by default in the Linux kernel. So that's where I'm, I'm going to switch to a little demo. And the setup is very simple. Uh, it's, it's not going to be anything spectacular, but it's just to show you that it works. It's uh, this board uh, with the Cortex-M4 on it and uh, my laptop connected by an Ethernet cable. And first thing I'm going to do is uh, reboot the machine and go into the bootloader. And from the bootloader, I'm going to run uh, a netboot command, which is going to boot uh, the kernel with the TCP IP stack in it from TFTP. And there it goes. It's starting. And as you can see, it's also booting pretty quickly. So the, the kernel is booted now. And um, the last line here is already an output from Pico TCP, which has a f uh, assigned a, a loopback interface. Now I'm going to configure uh, ETH0 to have an IP address and a netmask. Like this. So okay, this again is a is a uh, print K from uh, Pico TCP saying that it has indeed assigned this uh, IP. So let me now uh, try to ping the device from my machine, and we see indeed that it works. Okay, great. Uh, how can I now be sure that it's Pico TCP? I'm not just booting some random Linux kernel. We added some interface for that uh, to the kernel as well. And just a, a small uh, variable that you can y that you can cat and indeed okay procnet stack is now Pico TCP instead of the the standard uh, TCP IP stack. And the uh, last thing I want to uh, show in a demo is uh, I'm gonna wget uh, a binary from from my computer. Uh, this is iperf, which you can use to uh, to monitor network performance. I'm gonna start an iperf server on my laptop here. I'm con gonna connect from the board. So it should try to connect. And this is also where you see that we still got some work to do. We got a, an average throughput around one megabyte, sometimes uh, a, a bit more, sometimes a bit less. And um, this is just a proof of concept for now. Uh, and this is a tool that we use to, to, to check if the performance is, is up to, uh, if it's up to speed or not. So OK, we saw, we saw the, the kernel. Uh, running Pico TCP, and now I'm going to explain uh, why we did this and how we did this. So what we did is first remove the TCP IP part of the kernel, just to know how big is this. Uh, well, if you remove all of the networking, you, you remove about 400 kilobytes of the kernel size, but we kept uh, the whole networking infrastructure because you, you need uh, sockets on the local host to do some things as well, and also we reused uh, the device's interface uh, from the Linux kernel. But we have re removed the TCP IP part, so IPv4, and that saves about 160 kilobytes, and that's 10% of the kernel size that's running right here. Uh, then we added Pico TCP instead, uh, also IPv4 only, uh, and this added 40 kilobytes. So that's where we see that the Pico TCP is made for the embedded systems. It's only 40 kilobytes. And uh, this means that for the same functionality, we uh, reduce the kernel by uh, more than 100 kilobytes. 
How did we do this? So first part is very easy. In the kernel.config, uh, you set inet to no, but you still need net equals yes. So net is the part that I was talking about that's uh, providing you the, the <coughs> device's interface to transmit packets. Then we added a new module, PicoTCP. And you can ena enable it uh, by setting PicoTCP uh, equals yes in your .config. And we added the complete PicoTCP source tree, as you can, can find PicoTCP on GitHub. And we added that to uh, net slash TCPIP slash PicoTCP. And then we created a kconfig so that we can enable this. Uh, we created a make file uh, to select the right sources. Uh, we modified the original uh, kconfig. And then we needed some glue logic, because we got the P uh, PicoTCP uh, in one corner, and we got the normal Linux kernel with its interfaces that it was used to use, uh, and we need some glue in between of that. So the glue logic uh, adds this. We implement these proc files, which I showed you procnet uh, proc stack before. Okay, you don't really need procnet stack, but there's a few other uh, proc interfaces that you do need. Uh, also in proxys. And then IOCTLs. So IOCTLs is one of the ways you can communicate with the kernel from user space. And there's a lot of socket IOCTLs actually in the kernel. For example, to set your uh, Ethernet as address, as I just did with iConfig. Uh, so you need, you need a bunch of IOCTLs, which we also added to this glue logic. And the, these IOCTLs are then, then going to be translated to the native PicoTCP uh, uh, API so that it understands what the kernel was trying to do or what any tool from user space was trying to do. Then we need to register the INET protocol family and especially these IPv4 uh, protocols again, because we just removed them uh, by commenting out INET. And then another step that we need to take is to modify net device, which is this layer that allows you to communicate, re receive and transmit packets uh, through any, to any network device uh, that the kernel supports. And we have to reroute uh, these packets to and from the from the PicoTCP stack as well. So we did all of this in basically five files. The sixth is still a stop for now. And I'm not going to show you actual code, but I'm going to go through these file five files and explain you uh, what part of this glue logic it implemented. And you can find all of these files, by the way, in Linux slash net slash TCPIP, which is a new folder that didn't exist before. So core is the entry point. It has the underscore underscore in it. And this will call uh, pico stack in it, which is the initialization routine for our stack. And also AF INET TCP IP in it, which is in another module, which is going to register this address family. And it's also going to schedule pico stack tick. And this is the, uh, the clock that uh, our stack needs uh, to be called every once in a while. And we do that using a work queue in the kernel. Next file is uh, AF INET, so that's for address family INET. And this is going to register actually the, this protocol family again, which we have stripped before uh, using uh, there's uh, structs in the kernel like proto ops. And there you can set uh, all kinds of fields to the uh, callbacks that the kernel is expecting there. And uh, in this file, we also implement all of the BSD socket calls that you would normally uh, use on sockets like accept, bind, connect, uh, and so on. So they, uh, they are not actually implemented in this file, but they are uh, calling the original PicoTCP API from there, uh, but using the API that the kernel would expect from these functions. Next file is netdev. This is the link between the stack and the kernel's network device abstraction. And this is actually really nice because uh, we can re reuse any Ethernet or other network uh, device driver that already exists in the kernel. We don't have to rewrite everything from scratch because we just changed TCP IP stacks. And this is where the link happens. So packet send, packet transmit, and also the attach function. When you're going to uh, up or down a device, that's also where, where the link is happening. Uh, and then we have IOCTL. So that's the IOCTLs to call uh, kernel functions from, from user space. Uh, tools such as uh, ifconfig are going to use these. And here's a few examples of IOCTLs that are uh, implemented. That's get address, uh, get MTU, set flags, things like this. Last file uh, is proc.c, and this will implement a procnet route. And you guessed it, you will need this to use the route utility. So uh, 
Procnet route is going to uh, set or going to give you a list of all the routes that, uh, that are configured right now. So Pico TCP, although it is a very small embedded stack, uh, has IP filtering and routing and things like this set up. Uh, so you can still use all of these features. Uh, and it also implements the, the Procnet stack, which I catted before, that just prints Pico TCP. And uh, last one is net.c, so that's not really uh, there right now. It's just a stop, uh, but we, um, we implemented this because uh, RT Netlink is, uh, is a new, well, relatively new configuration uh, socket, and that's uh, used, for example, by IP Route 2. So if you're going to try IP Route 2 uh, on, on this proof of concept, it's not going to work yet. But all, all the stops are there for the callbacks that are needed. And uh, if someone wants to give us a hand, uh, they can implement these, and uh, we get more functionality. So to conclude, we have more or less the same level of functionality. Of course, it's just a proof of concept. Not everything is there yet, but it's perfectly possible, uh, especially when you uh, focus on the embedded devices. I'm not going to uh, say that you can use Pico TCP uh, and run your web server on top of this, or at least not, not uh, in a big server farm, at least for now. But for an embedded system, uh, I don't think you will miss any functionality because Pico TCP is really very complete. You get a smaller and a faster kernel. You get less RAM usage uh, because Pico TCP is tailored for these embedded systems. And you get less ROM uh, usage as well because yeah, the size of the, of the kernel is at least 120 kilobytes less. And uh, in the boot time uh, I measured here is about 15% faster. It was already pretty fast, but now it takes 1.04 seconds instead of 1.23, which is also nice. Uh, and you get less RAM usage, as I said before, but here's uh, one of the figures. I call it proc mem info. You get 216 kilobytes of actual uh, RAM that you can use more. Okay, on this system we had 32 uh, megabytes, but if you're using uh, a board that only has four megabytes, uh, then this is really, really important. But of course, there's still a lot, a lot of things to improve. Uh, this is just a proof of concept, as I said before. Uh, throughput is average. Uh, the same board with the original Linux kernel goes somewhere between 5 and 10 megabits per second. Uh, Pico, Pico TCP certainly can handle these speeds. We have embedded systems running bare metal that, that do Ethernet uh, line speeds, 100, and meg 100 megabits. So uh, it's, it's a problem with scheduling inside the kernel for now. Uh, the RT Netlink API is not, not complete yet, as I, as I stated before. Um, raw sockets also are not supported, and uh, what do you need raw sockets for? Uh, for example, the ping command is going to use raw sockets, so uh, for now the, boards, the board will reply to pings, but you cannot send pings to other targets uh, because that will require raw sockets and we don't have them. Uh, and this is actually because Pico TCP has no raw sockets for now. Uh, on the other hand, there is no IPv6 support yet, and that's not because of Pico TCP, because Pico TCP uh, supports IPv6 very well, but it's just the lack of glue logic and more interfaces to make there. And uh, that's it. Here I put a, a, a bunch of links. Um, myself, I am Maxime Vessau. I am a low-level embedded systems engineer. Uh, the company I work for is Altron Intelligent Systems, which is also backing the uh, development of the Pico TCP uh, project. It's, it's a free software, it's an open source project, it's on GitHub. Um, the kernel uh, I just demonstrated here is also on GitHub, here's the link. Um, and Pico TCP itself is, is, uh, has a website, picotcp.com. You can find it on GitHub as well, uh, and you can mail us, you can... Uh, you can send some pull requ uh, requests for, for, this, uh, for this kernel we just demonstrated or uh, just try it for yourself. And that's it for me. So if there's any questions about this, I'll be glad to answer them. Yeah? Um, so how safe is it to expose this tag to the real internet? Uh, we are doing quite some testing uh, on our stack as part of the project and we're uh, aiming really hard to comply to, uh, to all the RFCs we implement. So uh, it should be pretty safe. I'm not saying that there, there is no possibility to find some nasty buffer overflow or to crash the board. Uh, that, that is a point for sure. But um, 
the stack is being used in a lot of embedded systems that are connected to the internet, just not through the Linux kernel for now. So we're testing pretty hard on that. Yes? Um, we haven't focused, so the question is, um, is this ju just a quick hack or is it easy to plug another, another stack in, uh, in the Linux kernel, is that right? Uh, well, I must say we haven't focused on making the uh, kernel <laughs> interface to network stacks very generic because that's not something you want to do often and uh, especially for us the focus was getting Pico TCP in the, in the, st in the kernel and not Opening, opening up or making the kernel interface as clean as possible to plug any, any stack. So, not really, no. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Uh, you said that you are uh, testing the stack, so is it stable? Uh, PicoTCP is already stable, absolutely. Uh, we're very proud of that and you can uh, even check our test results uh, on GitHub. We got a link there. Um, but uh, the port to the kernel here, which I demonstrated, is absolutely not very stable, no. It's, uh, it's a proof of concept, absolutely, for now. But we plan on developing this further, uh, especially because there is some interest on the Linux kernel mailing lists and, and things like this for getting the, the kernel size down to use it on, on Cortex-M3 or even smaller systems, which is not possible with plain Linux. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, uh, there has been some projects where uh, TCP/IP stacks run in user space to get better latency and things like this. Uh, we did this with Pico TCP also. We uh, we actually started off as uh, running this in in user space first because it's it's easier to do. Um, but there we're still using uh, a ton device or a tab device uh, to get it out to the actual uh, network stack. Um, we haven't specifically done any uh, latency comparison on, on in that field, but it was very good from what I remember. We get a lot of throughput and, and, and really good latency uh, running the complete stack in user, in user space. Yeah. Uh, no, because at that point we still kept the whole uh, networking infrastructure that was in the kernel. Uh, I'm not sure how easy it is to have a ton or a tab device uh, and throw out all the, all the rest, so that's an exercise we didn't do. But it's perfectly possible to run t uh, Pico TCP uh, in user space, yes. Yeah, in the back. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I haven't tried only UDP in the Linux kernel, but Pico TCP with just UDP support should go somewhere near 20 kilobytes. Um, I can maybe show you uh, a, a compilation of. Uh, of Pico TCP right here. Okay, the uh, size are not great. Okay, TCP is still on. Let me disable p uh, TCP and see uh, how big it ends up. And enable UDP. <coughs> so there, okay, it's 50 kilobytes, that's weird. I probably missed some optimization. Uh, Yeah, it should be so somewhere around around this. Yeah, I got 24 kilobytes right here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? 
All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Maxime. Yeah, thank you.